that brethren himself when you're dealing with those who are weaker versus those who are stronger. And it went from Romans 14 verse 1 all the way through chapter 15 and verse 7. That whole section is dealing uh, with that. And the conclusion of it all, there is in verse 7, Romans 15 and verse 7. Therefore, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And I made this point last week that when a person becomes a Christian, Christ receives us as we are, having repented of our sins and having focused our mind on doing God's will. Even though our mind is not completely educated in the Word of God, there's still some things we don't fully understand or comprehend. And that's the same way with how we're supposed to receive one another when it comes to our brethren. You're going to have those brothers and sisters who are new in the faith and they have some concepts that's contrary to Scripture. As we've given the illustration, you might have a new brother or sister that is uh, new to the faith, and they still in their mind think it is wrong to eat pork. They might think it's wrong to do that. And so they have to, they have to be accepted, and we gradually have to help them be educated uh, in the Word of God. So we are to receive one another as Christ received us, to the glory of God. Basically, when a person becomes a Christian, about all they know at that point is the Bible is the Word of God, Jesus is the Son of God, and they know the plan of salvation. And that's probably about it. There may be a lot of things that they are unaware of from that point on. And so that's why after we baptize them, Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. You make disciples of all nations, you baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then you continue to teach them. We need to continue to teach them in the ways of God. Now, in Romans 15, beginning in verse 8, he is going to start a new section of thought in which he's dealing with uh, Jesus being the Savior of the Gentiles and how that's going to tie into his work as he plans to go to the city of Rome. And the reason why that's important is because what kind of city is Rome? Is it Jewish or Gentile? What kind of city would Rome be of the Roman Empire? Jewish or Gentile? Gentile. It would be a Gentile city. And so he's going to go there And because of that, uh, he is making it very clear, starting in verse 8, that uh, he is a servant uh, to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers, there in verse 8, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So he's going to talk about how that he is an apostle to to preach the word and the message to the Jews and the Gentiles. He's already covered that in the book previously, but he's re-emphasizing that thing, that concept. So it says in verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. That's the ancestors. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written. For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. And again he says, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud Him, all you peoples. And again Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse... And he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in hope, or excuse me, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with uh, all joy, peace, and believing 
that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that's going to set the stage for what he talks about uh, in the further part of the chapter, how that he is going to go from Jerusalem to Ikhlerium and then plans to visit Rome. And we'll, we'll get to that, we probably won't get to that tonight because we're going to cover uh, a lot of material tonight dealing with this concept of the Gentiles being in on the blessings of salvation. So you go back up to verse 8. Paul says, Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision. Christ Jesus became a servant to the circumcision. That is the Jewish people. And we see that he came in the lowly manner of uh, a servant. Philippians chapter 2. I want to hold your place here and look at Philippians chapter 2. Talks about when Jesus came to earth. He came to earth as a servant. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, verse 7, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Christ Jesus came, even though he was in the form of God and God, being equal to him, equal to the Father. He came in the flesh to be human, to live among us as a bond servant. And he came to serve Israel. What did Jesus do when he began his earthly ministry? He went about preaching But he also went about healing the sick. He was serving them. He was healing the sick. He was raising the dead. He was uh, performing these signs and miracles and these things to verify that he was indeed the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God. But also he was serving them. What do we find in John chapter 13? We find Jesus doing what? He is washing the feet of his disciples. That's what the lowliest servant of a house would do. They're there about to, about to uh, celebrate the Passover. And he puts himself in the position of the lowly servant and washing the apostles' feet. He came to serve, not to be served, he said. He said he came to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus came as a servant to Israel and to minister to them. You know, that's what the word minister means, a servant. And when we minister to someone, as Christians ought to do, and every Christian ought to be doing that, ministering to someone, that means serving them. We're in the capacity of serving people. And when we do that, we are uh, following the example of Jesus Christ. And it says there in Romans uh, 15 and verse 8, He became a servant to the circumcision, the Jewish people, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Jesus came to bring about a fulfillment that was made to the fathers. When you look at John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. John puts it this way concerning Christ. John 1 and verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This is He who... Whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Now look at verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So Christ Jesus came 
to the Jewish people for the truth of God. That's what Paul's saying there in Romans 15 and verse 8. So Jesus came to bring about the ultimate, complete truth. Well, there was partial truth in the Old Testament, but it was never meant to be whole. It's just part of it, part of the story. The rest of the story is found in the New Testament. That's where Jesus came and gave the gospel message and fulfilled those promises that were made to the fathers. Now, what promise is he talking about when you look at Romans 15 and verse 9? The promises that were made to their ancestors. That the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written. Now, Jesus came to be a servant to the Jewish people, verse 8 of Romans chapter 15. But also the Gentiles might be a part of this. They might be a part of this redemptive work of being saved by Christ. That the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. Why? Because they would be the recipients of God's mercy. Just like any Jewish person, like Paul, who believed and obeyed the gospel, could have the mercy of God. Any Gentile, that's anyone that's not a Jew, that person could receive the mercy of God if they believed and obeyed the gospel. So he's re-emphasizing some of the same things he talked about earlier in the book and reminding them that Jesus Christ came to fulfill those promises that were going to be made to the Gentiles. The Jewish people were of Israel. They were the, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the people known as the Israelites, the Jewish people. Everyone outside of Israel were known as Gentiles or the nations. And the promises that were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that Israel as a nation was the caretaker of were ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, which was to be for everyone. Now Paul is going to further prove that by going to the Jewish scripture and showing that. He's going to quote from the Jewish scripture and show that the Old Testament predicted that the Gentiles, that means all the rest of humanity, everyone else who's not Israelite, are going to have access to the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. So he begins quoting several passages here from the Old Testament. Verse 9, For this reason I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. That's from 2 Samuel 22 and verse 50. And Psalm 18 and verse 49. Jewish scriptures. The point is that he's making is this. The Jewish scriptures said the Gentiles would have reason to sing and to confess because they would be recipients of the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. Well, then again, he quotes some more scripture. Look at verse 10. Romans 15 and verse 10. Again, he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That's Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 43. That's something Moses wrote. So even Moses, the one who was the great lawgiver of the Old Testament, was talking about how the Gentiles could re rejoice. They could be the recipients of God's mercy. Look at verse 11. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud Him, all you peoples. That's from Psalm 117 and verse 1. A Jewish scripture. By the way, Psalm 117 is the shortest, shortest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the Bible. I think it only has two verses. It might be three, I can't remember. Someone want to look it up. Two? Okay, thank you. Only has two verses. It's the shortest chapter in the Bible. The longest chapter in the Bible is in Psalms 2. What chapter is that? 119. 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. So even that passage of Scripture there is talking about the Gentiles. They could praise God. Why? Because they could receive mercy through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, 
And he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. That is a quotation from Isaiah 11 and verse 10. Isaiah 11 and verse 10. So you have Isaiah, the great messianic prophet. The great prophet who was uh, prophesying about the coming of the Messiah and the coming of his kingdom. Speaking of how the Gentiles would have the Messiah rule over them as well. And in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now the reason why this is good news and makes me happy is because I'm a Gentile. I don't know about you. I'm a Gentile. I don't know if I have any Jewish blood in me. I got a little Scottish, maybe a little Irish. I got a little bit of Native American. I don't know, somewhere down the line, there might be some Jewish blood mixed in there, but it it doesn't matter. That's the good thing about all of this in Christ. It doesn't matter. I, as a Gentile, someone who is not a part of Israel can be just as saved as an Israelite or a Jewish individual because there is one Savior with one plan of salvation with one true church. And all people must be in that church in order to be saved. And so these promises were made to Israel and Israel was supposed to anticipate the coming of the Messiah and share the blessings but they didn't do that what did they think they thought all of the blessings of the messiah would be theirs and that they as a nation would be exalted above all the other nations and then all the gentile nations would be subservient to them and they would be a special people just because they were descendants of abraham isaac and jacob they missed the whole point they missed the whole point I'll illustrate it this way. It's like a, a wealthy man who has a son. And the wealthy man makes out a will. He's got millions of dollars. And he says to his son, Son, when I die, I want you to use this money to bless people. Give it to people who are in need. Give it to people who are wanting to start businesses. Give it to people who are, are having a hard time making it. And I want you to take this wealth and I want you to give it to those who need it. And then the father dies and the son says, I won't keep it all for myself. And does not distribute it and help those who are in need. That's what Israel did. They thought all of those blessings were going to be just for them. But it never was. Even in the prophecies... Uh, that's why he's quoting from the Old Testament scriptures. It never was just going to be for Israel. They were caretakers of God's will so that when the Messiah came, he could bless everybody of every nation. Now, what I want to do is go back and look at some of these prophecies in the Old Testament that are not mentioned here in Romans chapter 15 and look and see how that... That is the case that God wanted all people to be a part of this redemptive plan. Turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, all the way back to the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter 12. This is, uh, of course, after uh, the flood, after the the time of Noah. By the way, that movie, don't waste your money going to see that movie. It's so inaccurate and so unbiblical that it's uh, it's pitiful. I haven't seen it myself. I'll wait till it comes out on Blu-ray or whatever and uh, rent it or something. But it's, it's pretty pitiful. Not biblically accurate at all. But this is after the biblical uh, account of the flood that you find in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. Mankind began to multiply upon the face of the earth after um, the, uh, the flood and uh, all these nations started forming and such. 
And then God chose a man out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he was going to choose him because he was, so, he was part of the seed line. There was a special seed line, a genealogy that went all the way back to Adam through Seth, and that promised seed line was the one that was going to bring about the Messiah eventually. Well, Abram was a part of that seed line. Genesis 12 and verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. and You shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he's talking to Abram here. He's in uh, Ur of the Chaldees. You find that out in chapter 11, verse 31. And it says here in Genesis 12, God spoke to him, says, you get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. You get away from them and you're going to go to a land. There is the land promise that was made. The land flowing with milk and honey. That is the promised land that God would give to Abraham's descendants. Then in verse 2, he says, I will make you a great nation. There's the nation promise. So there was a nation land promise made to Abram and his descendants. He says, I'm going to bless you, Abram. I'm going to make your name great. Even to this day, Abraham's name is held in reverence. Not only among uh, Christians, but also among other religions as well. In Islam, his name is revered. In, uh, of course, Judaism, his name is revered. So his name is great even to this day. And you shall be a blessing. Abraham and his descendants are supposed to be a blessing to other people. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. Nations that bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse him will be cursed. And in you... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's the spiritual seed promise. You have to have the nation and the land for the spiritual seed to come forth. There has to be a place. There has to be a people. Then you can have the Messiah come. And that's exactly what God is setting up here as he is making the promise to the ancestor of the Hebrew people, uh, this is what's going to come about. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, if you want to turn in your New Testament to Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter uh, 3, verse 16, Paul says, Now to Abraham and to his seed, that would be his descendant, were the promises made. He does not say to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So we know this promise in Genesis chapter 12 is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We know about this in Genesis 12, 7, Genesis 13, 15, and also in Genesis 24, 7. In his seed, one of his descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so we see here that that's referring to Jesus Christ. And so when the promise was initially given to Abram, it was supposed to be for everybody. There had to be some preparing for that. You had to prepare for that to happen. But it was supposed to be for everyone. It's like someone says to a person, I'm going to give you this money. And I want you to construct this beautiful 
uh, building and hall. And it's going to be a blessing for everyone. People can come there and have birthday parties for their children. People can come there for family reunions. People can come there and use it for various purposes. Kind of, kind of like a community center. And the person builds that and then keeps it for themselves. That's what Israel did as a nation. They wanted to keep that for themselves. It wasn't ever meant to be for themselves. It was meant to be for all people. But before everyone could appreciate that community center, there has to be some preparing for it. And that's what you have in preparing the nation land promise. Then when that is fulfilled, the spiritual seed promise can come about. By the way, in the book of Joshua, it makes it very clear that God fulfilled his promise to Israel to give them the land. There's nothing else left to be fulfilled. He gave them the land. So there's... There's no future fulfillment at the end of time. That's all been done. The book of Joshua makes it very clear. So we have here Christ as the promise, as he would be a part of the Hebrew nation, as Abram is the ancestor of the Hebrew people. Any questions or comments before we go any further? Joshua 2143. Look at Joshua 2143. Joshua 2143. You remember Joshua went in and conquered the land. And it says in verse 43, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, their ancestors, and they, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. You look at verse 45. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Joshua 21, basically verses 4, 43 through 45. The promise given to Abram to give them the land was fulfilled when Joshua went in and took it. All of it came to pass. Now we know during Solomon's reign that he extended the borders even a little bit further. However, that that does not in any way negate the fact that it was already fulfilled in the days of Joshua. So that promise of that land given to Abram's descendants and they being the Hebrew people was fulfilled in the days of Joshua. You're forgiven. Yes. Yes. After the 40 years of wandering, a new generation that Joshua took in, remember uh, Moses couldn't, because of his sin, he couldn't take him in. And so he died, and, and God took his body and buried him. And so they went in through Joshua and, and conquered the land. So uh, that was a fulfillment of that. So uh, it was after the 40 years of wandering. So you have this preparing period, which it took. You know, Abram lived at this time, Joshua, excuse me, Genesis 12, the time of Abram. That's about roughly 2,000 years before Jesus was born that this promise is being made. So we're talking about 2,000 years of preparing for Jesus to come into the world. That's a lot of preparing. But all that was preparing for Jesus so that Jesus could bless all nations. Now, look at Isaiah chapter 2. There are many passages we can go to. We're just going to hit a few of the highlights. Isaiah chapter 2. When you come across the prophecies about the church kingdom, the church being the kingdom and the kingdom being the church, one and the same in the the Bible, the establishment of the church, you go to Isaiah chapter 2, This prophecy about the coming of the church shows it's going to be for all nations. It's going to be for all nations. 
Isaiah chapter 2. Excuse me? Oh, verse 1. Isaiah 2 and verse 1. It says, The word Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Where did the church start? City of what? Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2. Verse 4. He shall judge between nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's talking about the peace there would be within the church. People who were hateful to one another are going to be taught in the church, you love your enemies and you love your neighbor as yourself. So that hostility would end within the church. Jew and Gentile could be brought together in the church. And so you go back up and you see that this he's using symbolic language here, talking about how this organization, which is the Lord's church, will be exalted, uh, be established on the top of the mountains and be exalted above the hills, and that all nations would flow into it. Now you go to Acts chapter 2, which was the Jewish feast day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, And it says there were Jews there from all the nations that were there for that Jewish feast day. But not only that, you go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, you have the first Gentiles, people who were non-Jewish, entering into the church. And thus all nations would flow into it. That means when they were converted, the Lord added added them to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. And so this prophecy here by Isaiah is making it very clear. This is for everyone, all nations. It's not just for one nation. It's for all nations. So the promise is there for the Gentiles that they could receive mercy through uh, Jesus Christ in the church that he promised to establish. Remember Matthew 16 and verse 18. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. That's exactly what Isaiah is talking about here in Isaiah 2 verses 1 through 4, the Lord's church. Now, same book, look at chapter 62. Isaiah 62. Verse 1 and 2. Here is a prophecy about a special name that would be given to God's people. But something had to happen first before that name could be given to God's people. Isaiah 62 and verse 1. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. Again, the starting point of the church, Acts chapter 2, is the city of Jerusalem. That's where it was established the year 33 A.D. of the first century. So that's why it's, the emphasis there is on Jerusalem. That's going to be the beginning point. Verse 2. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will name. So the Gentiles are going to see the righteousness of God and the kings of the earth your glory. Well, when you go into the New Testament, what do you have in Acts chapter 10? You have the first what coming into the church? First Gentiles. The Gentiles are seeing the righteousness of God. Where's the righteousness of God found? Romans 1.16 is found where? 16 and 17. Found in the gospel. The righteousness of God is found in the gospel. So you have Peter there preaching the gospel 
to Cornelius and his household. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit, which was a miraculous sign to prove that God would accept them. It was a unique situation. They were told in Acts 10 and verse 48 to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in, in essence, to obey the gospel. As a result of that, you had the first Gentiles coming into the church. Remember the prophecy in Isaiah 2 said all nations would flow into the church. And when that happens, Isaiah 62 says, I'm going to give a new name to my people when that happens. Now, Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, what is that new name that's given to God's people? Christian. And notice the prophecy said God would give that name. See, the name Christian is not a name given in derision by the enemies of God that the disciples just adopted. That's what many people will tell you. According to this prophecy, that's the new name that was given by God Himself. In Acts 11 and verse 26, talking about the spreading of the gospel, it says in verse 26, And when they had found Him, Paul, they brought Him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church, and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, when you do a little study of the word called in the original language, it denotes a divine calling. God called them Christians. That's who called them Christians. That was the new name that was prophesied of in Isaiah 62 and verse 2. But first... Who had to see the righteousness of God? The Gentiles. Well, you had that in Acts chapter 10. The very next chapter, Acts chapter 11, God gives the new name, Christians. 26. Acts 11 and verse 26. Now, the time is running out. I want to go through this a little bit quicker. Um, in Acts chapter 15, what were they dealing with? They were dealing with a problem in the church, right? And that problem in the church that they were dealing with had to do with the um, false teachers, the Judaizers. They were adding to the gospel plan of salvation and said, you've got to keep the law of Moses. They've got to be circumcised or they cannot be saved. So those Judaizers in the church were basically saying, you've got to become Jewish, then you can become Christian. Yeah, okay, we'll accept you. But you've got to become Jewish first, then become a Christian, and that'd be okay. Well, in Acts chapter 15, verses 15 through 18, as they disputed over that, they went to the Scriptures. They went to, and they quoted from the book of Amos, which said that the Gentiles would be a part of God's uh, new order of things. And so that's in found in Acts chapter 15, verses 15 through 18. They appeal to the Scriptures again, the Jewish Scriptures, which says the Gentiles are going to be a part of it. They don't have to become Jews. They, As they are, whatever they are, they can obey the gospel, be added to the church. That would be like me going to some other country and say, you've got to become an American citizen, and then you can become a Christian. Well, that would be foolish. That would be wrong. You obey the gospel, whatever you are, and you're added to the church by the Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. The book of Ephesians talks about how important the church is. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Paul says, For he himself is our peace, talking about Jesus, who has made both one, that's both Jew and Gentile, one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. The commandments contained in ordinances is talking about the old law. That's been fulfilled. Verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. There's where the one church comes in. There's only one church. Jew and Gentile has to be in that one church. Not many denominations. One church. 
the Bible teaches. And therefore, when people obey this plan of salvation, no matter their background, no matter the color of their skin, it doesn't matter the language they speak, when they obey the truth, they are added to the one body, the church. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. The Gentiles, Ephesians 3 and verse 6, should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ through the gospel. Now that's all tying in to what uh, Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 15. And there's many other passages we could look at. But I looked at these passages because I wanted to go all the way back to the beginning of their ancestors, Abram, who became Abraham, and show from Genesis chapter 12 on the promise was made for all nations that when the Messiah comes, when the Savior comes, He is going to show mercy through the gospel to everyone who believes and obeys Him. And it doesn't matter what their nationality is. That's irrelevant. I mean, right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. They wanted that special status with God, and they had that when they were obedient to God's will, but they kept trying to be like everybody else. And that's the problem when Christians try to be like everyone else and, and think and act like everyone else. They lose their distinction and they lose those blessings from God. That's a good point. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 and 28. And talking about people obeying the gospel and becoming Christians. Galatians three twenty-seven and 28. Paul says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ... There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, that means you belong to Christ as a Christian, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So all those promises, even though made specifically for Abraham and his descendants, it was meant for everyone who did what Abraham did, which was have obedient faith. Everyone who followed in the steps of Abraham, Romans chapter 4, would be blessed as Abraham was blessed. So going back to Romans chapter 15 and summing things up, verse 13 is a, a, a summation of what he's saying here. Romans 15 and verse 13. He says, may, now may the God of hope fill you, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the God of hope gives us all joy and peace in believing. We believe God's will. We obey His will. And then we can abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about what that means in our devotional time in just a moment.